Well, this is Snetterton, and it's the 24-hour race, the Will Hire 24-hour race to be exact, and it's the first time that this race has been run purely for saloon cars. There's a tremendous selection of what you can buy on the British market. Apart from the obvious British cars with the Rover, which finished second last year, there's Lancia, there's Volkswagen, there's Volvo, of course, and up at the far end of the pits, there's a tremendous interest from General Motors with both the Astras and the Monza. From the Japanese point of view, there has to be, obviously, a tremendous fillet for them with fastest car in practice being the Colt. And there's no doubt that as far as Colt are concerned with a turbocharged engine, a win here would do a great deal to establish the reliability of turbo in what is basically standard production saloons because this is Group N. It's not the ETC in Group A where pretty heavy modifications are allowed. It's going to be an interesting race. The conditions are absolutely ideal. Very hot, tremendous sun, there's a little bit of wind, but uh, the hot weather could, of course, prove to be havoc with some of the cars. We're a few minutes away from the start of the race, so let's go and talk to some of the drivers. Richard Atwood, uh, Porsche, and now Mercedes. Well, I only go for quality, you know. <laughs> what do you feel like compared to a 24-hour race? Saloons. Well, I've never done one, so I don't know, you know, I'm driving on road tyres is quite awkward because they don't react the way that race tyres do, so uh, it's going to be a novel uh, go for me. What about the car? You reckon it's going to be competitive? I think it is competitive. It's on the front of the grid, so it's competitive, obviously. I mean, but any 24-hour race, you just have to wait and see how things go out. Um, the race is going to be obviously won and lost in the pits. Well, we look forward to seeing whether you can win, not lose it, in the pits. Well, hopefully. Why not? Thanks, Richard. The 190 16-valve Mercedes-Benz is a triumph of cooperation between the British Cosworth firm and Mercedes-Benz. It's proved itself already in a couple of short races, but how it will go in 24 hours is, of course, the burning question. James Weaver, why are you six seconds off the pace? I told you weren't going to ask me that. Um, we just got too much understeer, really, but it's not quite as bad as that. We're a couple of seconds adrift, but um, at night the car handles very well, but it doesn't seem too happy first thing this morning. It's a bit like me. It doesn't go, you know, a bit slow starting in the morning, I think. How do you view the prospect of a 24 hour race? With horror. Um, I hate mowing the lawn. I must admit, I was going to mow the lawn this weekend, but Michael Scott, the 96 Club, asked me if I'd come and drive with him, and uh, rashly I said yes. But I think I'm going to enjoy it. It'll be all right. Well, we think you'll enjoy watching you go around there, and best of luck to you. Thank you very much. Barry is one of the older drivers in the race. Um, do you sort of view the 24 hour race as a great physical strain? Oh, definitely, yes. But there's lots of other things I can think of doing <laughs> during the night than driving cars around Snedden. Much nicer things. <laughs> no, no, it's great fun. Yeah, it, it is. It's hard work. It's terribly hard work at Snetterton because you've got no time to relax. The corners keep rushing up at you. You haven't got a sort of Mozart straight to relax and take a few deep breaths. Now, this is the first time, in fact, we had a pure saloon car race without the sports cars intervening. Do you think this could affect the result? Cars like the Capri, which are well developed, perhaps could be the car to watch, do you think? Yes, I think a saloon car will win it. <laughs> what I mean is, um, yes, uh, I think the Capri. A Capri is a very reliable car, and I think it'll just tram round and round and round. We don't know what the Mercedes is going to be like. That's supposed to be reliable, and we've all read about them being so brilliant. But they weren't all that quick last night. I think the Sturion's uh, exceptionally quick motor car. Well, that'll stay together is another thing, because it's very difficult to keep a turbo car cool, you know, in the heat of the moment. And um, silly things go wrong with them. But I, I think probably a Capri will be a, a front runner. The Opel... Tony, an old warrior, I think he'll, his, his team will keep the Opals going around there. That's the one to watch. Yeah. You reckon that the Opal could be the one to watch today? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think they might have something up their sleeve there. It's pretty good. I don't know about the little Turbo Escort. That might be the car, you know. It's going to be quick to start with. Oh, I think it'll fly for a while. The first few laps are going to be quite exciting, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think so too. Barry, thank you very much. Best of luck in the race. Thanks very much. Okay. Right. Team director of GM Dealer Sport. I don't know where this come from at all. <laughs> because we needed to have four team managers handling the four cars. And uh, the uh, marshals seemed to think that you shouldn't really be there unless you had a team manager's uh, sticker. So they've, in they've instituted that we should now have a team director over the team managers. I don't know why. Who's going to use the most trouble, controlling the drivers or controlling the four team managers? Barry Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Billy zips under. <laughs>
Well, seriously, we come to the 24-hour race. Obviously, GM are very anxious to get this thing right this time. Yeah, well, we hope this year that we're not going to have any problems at all and um, the Mons is going to run faultlessly. We've got a good team of drivers. This year, they're very, very matched. There's absolutely nothing between them at the present minute. Um, the, they're lapping at the same speeds. We've tried with full tanks. The car's even handling better with full tanks. And, uh, and at sprint meetings, when it's running with probably three or four gallons in, just... You going to make any predictions? No, uh, I wouldn't like to make predictions. Mercedes is very, very quick. We just hope that uh, we can work quicker in the pits because if they've got to change brakes as regularly as the rumours go, then we should be well in there. Well, it's something we look forward to. It's a fascinating race. And Bill, best of luck to GM. Thank you very much. Tony, how many 24-hour races now? Oh, I don't know. I've done all of these. I God knows how many more. We've done about five Spas, three Le Mans, Daytona, a lot of them. What particular threat does this one present? Where's the difficult one about the Snellerton race? Oh, this is very difficult. This is the most difficult of the lot because you don't have any way you can relax at all. There's a lot of cars on the circuit. There's no long straights like you have at Le Mans or Spa. Uh, it, this is the most difficult of the lot. Well, now, you've been trying for a long time to uh, get this right with an Opel Monza. Do you think this could be the year? Well, I don't know. We're 14th on the grid. We've got every chance, haven't we? Does that matter, though? I don't think it does, no. We, we're very happy. We finished second here two years ago behind a 92S Porsche, and I think we'll find that the Monza goes very well. Well, we hope so as well. Best of luck, Tony, before the start. Thank you. Another of Big Bill Clarence's GM charges is the Astra GTE of John Flewellyn, who had some bad luck last year. Last year's 24 hour race, John, ended rather abruptly for you just after dawn. Uh, with all traffic, and just saloons this time, uh, what do you think? You've practiced? Do you feel that you're going to have the same problems last year with the traffic? I think this year is certainly going to be a much harder race uh, than last year because you've got a lot more regular urinal competitors out there. It's all saloon cars. And as you can see from the practice times, it's going to be very, very close indeed. Uh, I think the thing to do is just hang back the first two or three hours and let them get on with it, the boys who want to, and sort it out from there. Hopefully the Astra is going to figure very well indeed. Um, we're sort of expecting to run on 28s, 29s, and I think you'll see this car start and figure about after 16, 18 hours. Well, we certainly hope so as well, and after last year, it'd be just a reward for a lot of hard work. Yeah, this year, though, you probably don't know this, but the car was virtually written off two weeks ago. And uh, Marshall Asquith had worked very hard and rebuilt the car, and hopefully it's all right. We ran it first time on Friday night, and, um, you know, it's... It seems to be okay. We had a lot of oversteer problems, and Mr. Marshall's messed about here. <laughs> we had a lot of oversteer problems, but we've seen to have cured those now, and uh, it'll be all right. Russell Brooks is our main hope in the middle of the night. Yeah, the major thing must be that at least you haven't got Marshall driving it. Quite, yeah. It wouldn't fit in the seat quite, and uh, with a little car like this, I think his weight may slow it a bit as well. Definitely. Thanks very much, John. Russell, you've been a very regular competitor in one motor race a year. It's the 24-hour race here at Snetterton. Why just that race, and do you enjoy racing? I certainly enjoy this event. I think it's very different from the other races I've done. Uh, stamina comes into it. Tremendous at atmosphere within the team, and I think it's a very, very enjoyable event. I hope I'm back next year as well. Well, we hope you are as well, but what about the chances this year? you think it's going to work out? I think they're very, very good. I mean, uh, you should never make predictions, but... John's a very, very good driver, very pleased with Andy Ackley, get on with him well, and I think the car's performing well. We're not going to be the quickest car out there, but with something like three and a half, three and three quarter hours between stops because of the uh, fuel consumption, uh, we should be in there with a very good chance. Well, we hope so as well. Look forward to it, Russell, and it must be a change from rallying. Thank you, it is, yes. Very much a private entry in the 24-hour race is this 320i BMW. Have they operated this car very much for the race, I asked the team? No, not a great deal. Um, all the usual sort of things, all the safety items, but I mean, basically, um, the car has to be fairly standard. You're running, obviously, for reliability because you're a bit up on weight on some of the things like the Strada. Oh, that's right. I mean, we are about 200 pounds heavier than the Strada, and that is obviously a handicap, but we're hoping that BMW's famed reliability will uh, see us through, and we'll be here at 4 o'clock, and hopefully reasonably up in the, in the results. We hope so as well. After last year, two and a half hour delay with the Caterham Super 7, a change of car should work well. That's right. Thanks very much. The different sorts of car in this race alone are well worthwhile looking at, 
let alone the fact that we've got some well-known drivers changing mounts. What's a data post driver doing in a different car? Well, we're driving a Fiat in this long distance race, as a sort of uh, invitation drive, and uh, we'll see what happens. I believe Ford and Fiat are going to build a world car, if you believe the popular press, or I thought I'd sort of, uh, you know, start things off in the right way. Well, you certainly have, and somebody else started off in the right way, because both you and uh, Patrick Watts were involved in an incident, I know, on Monday, and lo and behold, somebody took it off this and uh, dented that one for you. Yeah, well, it's following us around, really, at the moment, but uh, hopefully that's the end of our troubles, and it's going to go well for the next 24 hours. There's no way you can blame Jerry Marshall for this. Well, I don't expect so. We better not do that. He won't bother the beer otherwise, or something, yeah. Ian, I think this is the first time, actually, you've done the 24 hours, isn't it? That's absolutely right. I haven't done a 24 hour race before, so uh, I'm looking forward to this one. Should be good fun, I hope. Well, that's also the first time for the Lancia. What do you think the chances are of it lasting out 24 hours pounding around here? Uh, well, it ought to last, as you probably know. This is the car that did the 24 hour uh, speed run at uh, the Myra test track with the four girls driving. Uh, I'm certainly a little bit more concerned about the brakes and so on here, but I think as far as lasting, the car ought to keep going, although we did have a misfire in practice. Uh, unfortunately, we still haven't really got some of the right things homologated for the car, so we are limited on tyre size, which is probably the one thing that's really holding us back, because engine performance at the moment is quite good, but uh, there's an awful lot more we could do to get the car to go around the corners a bit quicker, I think. Preparation down to Ian Taylor Racing? Not at all, no. The car is owned and run by uh, Mike Spence uh, at Reading, who are a, a local last year dealers, and obviously one of the main reasons I'm driving this car is that I do run these uh, Lancia Delta Turbos at my race school at Thraxton, so that's uh, the, the reason for the tie-up. Well, the hot weather on turbos, looking at it from the experience that you've got, do you think it's going to play havoc with them? I haven't got a clue. I mean, it, it could do. I see you're absolutely right that they can get a little bit uh, temperamental in this hot weather. I think we do have to be careful when we come in to stop that we keep the engine running for a while because the turbo can get very overheated if you just come in and switch off. But, uh, well, let's just, just have to suck it and see, I think. Well, Ian, tremendous race. We're looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Okay. Tiffany Dell, you're more worried about the clock than the car. Very important. They're very important. When you're doing two hours and four hours stints, maybe in the night, it's nice to know, you know, look at the clock, see how long we've got to go. Well, now, you ran this car last year, and at one time it was going very well. What's the difference between this year's car and last year's car? Well, this year we're very, very happy that it's a beautiful, hot, sunny day because the 1985 starion has got the uh, intercooler homologated. So it's a big advantage over last year's car, and really that's the only difference. We've got the intercooler between the turbo and the engine, which means you can run a, a more powerful engine with the same boost. Well, now, the car's fastest in practice. I don't know which of you put the lap time up, and I'm not going to ask for embarrassment's sake, but just supposing, do you reckon it's going to go at that pace throughout the race? Well, we think 23, certainly. I mean, uh, it was Colin this morning. I was still in bed. We, uh, we both qualified in the night, and I said, well, I'll have the sleep, and uh, you can go and qualify. And he did a very good job. The captain put it on pole position, but uh, certainly 23s for the race. So you're going out there to try and depress the opposition straight away? Well, I don't think we'll be the only ones. I think with a clear track, you know, the Capri's very fast, the second, the Mercedes are very fast, but we hope they'll run out of brakes, and... Uh, this, uh, Andy McClellan didn't really do any time this morning, so I'll be interested to see what he does in the race. Any weak point on the car that you'd say, yeah, we're going to have to watch that? No, the drivers. <laughs> the car's fabulous. It's just whether we can keep pedalling round and round with only two of us. But uh, if Jackie Ix and Derek Bell can do it, I'm sure we can. Colin Blower drives this car normally in the short races in the Group N series. Does he think it's going to last the race OK? Well, certainly with the uh, intercooler, I mean, it, it should be a, a great advantage. So, um, I mean, this heat doesn't worry us uh, like it would do if, if we had an intercooled car. You've driven the car probably more racing miles, or certainly as many as anybody else. You reckon it's going to be there at the end of 24 hours? Yes, I'd like to think it would be. I mean, I always remain cautious about these things, but nothing has been spared on the car, and uh, a little confidence in TIFF, and uh, I hope that I can not let anyone down as well, so uh, I, I hope it will be there at the end. Great, Colin. Thank you very much. So the Colts Turan Turbo in pole position. And behind him, the first of the Capris, number 43, the Roy Eaton car. These drivers coming basically from the oval scene. This could be a very interesting race because the Mercedes third fastest, then the Turan fourth fastest, and last year's winner, the Rover Test fifth fastest, could make all the difference.
There are a number of factors in a race like this that can make the difference between winning and losing. First and foremost, a driver like John Cooper has to remember that it's a 24-hour race and not set out as if it was a sprint. Likewise, keeping the car cool before the start because you can do nothing much after it is important for driver's comfort. Will Hire's managing director, Roger Williams, is driving the Will Hire Telecom Capri and Barry Williams starts in car number 40. With a lot of experience behind him, the 46 years old Bromyard driver could be very much a force to be reckoned with. Toyotas and, of course, the Ilford Escort Turbo. This could be a big surprise in the hands of Mike Smith. Lanfranchi's Monza is well back on the grid, but one up for its size is the Vauxhall Nova number 77 of James K, with father Peter cleaning the screen. But it's Class C, the up to two litre cars, that GM dealers sport are making a big challenge with the new Astros, all of which have gone well in practice. From the air, a superb shot of the colourful grid, the magnificent crowd, on a beautiful day, as they set off on their pace lap. The blower car in pole position. And from inside Land Frankie's Monza, we see the cars move away down the straight into the first corner at Snetterton, which is Richard's corner, a fast right-hander. Back at the start, the pace car pulls off down the slip road towards the pits. The drivers in the front wait for the green light as the packed field rushes up now towards the start. And this won't be valid if that front row doesn't stay reasonably in line. It does, they're away, and it's the Colt into the lead. And there's drama at the first corner, as the Mercedes, after a slow start, has a slight collision with the Rover, and slides off well and truly onto the grass. John Cooper loses a lot of places in another shot from inside Van Frankie's Opal, as the car regains the circuit. Now we see something of the General Motors strategy, as passing Mike Smith on the inside, Van Frankie begins to move up. There's not quite space to get through there as he comes out of steer corner. But he's through and past and onto the tail of a Capri ahead. On the right of your picture, the Wilhire Capri of Roger Williams. This is down the Revit straight towards the Essex. Into the S-Bend, looking there for a position to go through. Brake, change down. A tight line coming out of here, correction required. Under the road bridge. And now round the right-hander in front of the grandstands. And it's the Toyota Corolla that's about to be pressed. Someone raises the dust up ahead as they come round at the completion of the first lap. This is Colin Curve and they're coming into Russell Corner. Up into fourth gear. And this is the teasing Russell over the curb, a wicked little twitch there, and past the pits at the end of lap one. Lap one, out of some 24 hours of racing round Snetterton. A blink of brake lights in front from the Toyota, and then Frankie begins to close. Into Sear once again, and through on the inside. That's the John Cooper Mercedes that spun out on the first lap, now in front of the Opal. Will the 3-litre Monza have enough power to go by the 2.3-litre Mercedes? Down the straight once more, there's not very much in it. The Mercedes goes past the Will Hire Capri. Then Frankie comes into his braking area and changes down. He's quicker into the corner and quicker out of it. Opposite lock again and under the bridge. A tight line there on the tail of the Capri as he lines up to try and find a way through. The Mercedes raises the dust and there's no way through there. Door shut firmly in the face. And now another close look as they come up towards Russell once again. Past the pits, lap two. And look at the inside as they come up now towards the right-hander. And into Rich's corner, he's through under braking. Now the Mercedes to contend with as they come to Sear. 
and a repeat performance. A Capri ahead could well be the next victim. Down the straight and a glance in the mirror to see what the Mercedes is up to from behind. And past he comes on maximum speed. Breaking hard, the Monza looks as if it might go through once more. But John Cooper keeps the door firmly closed. He's out slowly, however, and right on his tail now, the Monza essays to have another go. Cooper has calmed after that first death-defying moment. Opposite lock from both drivers as they come through, and the Monza is alongside. Paul Taft in rover number 10 heads a Capri through. And there's the second of the rovers, driven by last year's winning team. There's Dan Frankie's Monza, and he's ahead of the Mercedes now. And Capri's in abundance come through here. The S's once again. And all the track and some of the glass being used. John Cooper comes back, and here's the leader. Colin Blower with the Colts to Ryan. So far, so good for the Japanese. In second place, it's number 43, going hard and well, Roy Eaton with the Capri. And there's Barry Williams climbing all over the rover. A pit stop for number 73, the little Fiat of performance car. This had a problem during the course of practice, and Jesse Cross brings it into the pits as the rover now heads Lan Frankie. Lan Frankie behind the rover. This is the car that Pete Hall's team drove into second place last year. That's Riches, and we're coming up towards Sear. Change down, a look for the inside, but the door's firmly closed. 3.5 litres of V8 versus 3 litres straight 6. In a straight line, at the moment, they're evenly matched. Towards the breaking point, and then Frankie wondering whether this might be the place. It is. He outbreaks the rover to snatch another place. Into the essence, closing on a slower car. Under the bridge, and the gap shrinks. While out in front, the Colts to Ryan, Colin Blower aboard, is now beginning to catch up with back markers. The BMW about to be lapped. And there is the Eaton Capri, going well and going strong, using the curb as well. The Rover, with bits of bodywork flapping about, comes sideways, followed by Barry Williams. Paul Taft under heavy pressure. And the GTV Alpha, followed by the Toyota going hard and well. The leader comes through and is followed by one of the Fiat's. BMW tucked in behind, watching events. And here a clutch of Capri's and that rover of Taft, as Williams nips through past the back marker. The rover follows suit. Martin Carroll's Mercedes presses last year's winners. The rover's right off the circuit, almost catches the side of the bridge in his efforts to stay ahead of the Mercedes. And now the Ilford Capri being pressed hard too. Through the corners, the little Fiat speed is amazing. A rocking break there on number 73. That's the cross Walton Everett Fiat out again and about to be lapped by a Capri. Meanwhile, number 50, the John Llewellyn Vauxhall, is going well. And as more Capris and Astras sort themselves out, we talk to John Cleland about his forthcoming drive in the Monza. Um, no truth in the rumour that you're going to drive in the kilt for coolness. <laughs> None at all. I'm going to get all the difficult bits at night. Tony does all the daytime stuff. What do you think the chances are this year? You had some ill luck last year, but do you see that the car should be competitive? Yes, I think the cars there are thereabouts. We were fifth fastest in the darkness last night. 
the car handles as well and full tanks as it does on empty ones. So that's, yes, it's looking good. We've got a fairly strong team of drivers. We've got that bloke McRae for the stuff. If it ever gets foggy at night, we'll use him. As far as uh, strategy is concerned, are you out there on, a, on an agreed lap time or are you sort of driving at the pace of the traffic? Well, the idea is that if, uh, if the car's comfortable to do 26s or 27s, then that's where we'll do it. Never mind everyone else, we'll drive what the car feels comfortable to do. It's a long race, it's 24 hours, you know. It's, if the car's happy to do that pace, then fine. We're not going to push it yet. We might as well sit back and wait and see what's going to happen. The heat is playing havoc with oil temperatures, and in comes the little Nova of James K to explain what the problem is. It has to be changed, and it's a comparatively long stop. Peter Kay in the background gives his advice. While Paul Taft comes in with the Klaxon Rover for further problems to be looked at. Out goes James Kay. But the anxiety for the General Motors pit is by no means over. The Opal is in. A stone has gone through the radiator and it's lost all its water. Dan Frankie stands disconsolately knowing that there's probably damage to the cylinder heads as a result of overheating. A complete radiator change takes place. Not an easy job on a hot day with a hot car. Stoyak calm, on goes the helmet, and then Frankie repairs to join the fray. In goes the water, and hopefully down goes the bonnet, the engine started and back into the race goes Tony, knowing that he's got to keep one eye on that temperature gauge. Meanwhile, the Swinford Motors Mercedes has been brought in. The pace has been hot for that too, and they have brake problems, as John Cooper explains to Richard Atwood, who's outside the car while John's been doing the work. Bleeding hot brakes is not the easiest thing to do under race conditions. They must be certain that all the air is out, lest brake failure should occur. In go some new discs. John Cooper has a further conference. Down goes the bonnet, and it's back into the race for the Swinford Motors Mercedes. The BMW comes in. This is a purely scheduled stop. The car's running reliably, but it's not really quick enough to be a front runner and must hope that some of the other cars in the 2 litre class have problems while it runs reliably. And in comes the Goodrich Staraya. Already there are problems there. It looks very hot and sticky inside and the overheating that is often the problem with turbocharged cars is beginning to cause havoc. Tiff Dell goes in, the car has lost its lead. Refueling going on, but they're obviously worried about whether or not this is going to be a car that will last throughout the 24 hours. Hot brake discs, not the easiest thing to handle. The wheels go back on, the car is off the jacks. A short conference between the drivers, the engine restarts, and it's back into the race with Tiffany Dow at the wheel. In now comes Tony Lanfranchi once more. As suspected, the problems were not just confined to the radiator. From the steam, there's overheating, and there's a head gasket problem. It's an hour-long job to change the head, and that's what General Motors face now. No one could describe it more clearly. So, Tony explains to the team the problems with the car while the race rages on. There's some recompense for these problems as the Astras are going very well in the Class C category and are at the moment fighting it out for the lead. The opposition, Rod Burley and John Brindley with the Toyota. Out goes the Salisbury Astra once more. While the Martin Carroll, Mike Knight, Gerard Sarr, Mike Wilde's Mercedes is steadily climbing up the field and is now in third place. 
More problems for number 77 here, as Peter K backs the car up for further work to be done. The tappets are not getting oil through due to the heat, and there's damage obviously being caused. Meanwhile, as the Nova prepares to re-enter the race, Graham Scarborough brings his Capri in for a routine stop. This certainly looks as if the predictions about Capris have proved to be very right indeed, because they're well up among the leading bunch. As Kay's Nova goes out, John Clayland gets out of the Opal. They've decided definitely to change that head gasket, and it's that hour-long job that they're dreading. The head, too, may be warped, and it could not necessarily be the cure that they're looking for. Back on the track, however, the blower car is still going well. But going even better is the Capri number 43 of Roy Eaton, that's into the pits now, shared with David Oates and John Clark. The Fiat's still ahead of Barry Williams there, who's now in the lead. And the Ilford Escort there, the turbocharged car of Mike Smith, is proving both fast and reliable. Martin Carroll is going extremely well with his team in the Mercedes 19016. The Toyota, under opposite lock there, is still racing with the Astros, and the race looks far from settled at this stage. John Flewellyn in definitely with a chance, while James Kay seems for the moment to have his problems over. The head is going back on the Monza, and as time wears on, the race of attrition continues. To continue in this car, John Cleland. And away he goes. It's still going to be one eye on the temperature gauge, one eye on the mirror, and the third eye, I don't know where he gets that from, on the road. Out of the pits as evening draws on. The Snetterton 24 Hours is living up to its name as a fast, hard battle. Fatigue for drivers and fatigue for cars in very hot weather is beginning to take its toll. The Monza, however, sounds healthy enough. He's got a long way to make up and there's no point in trying to spare the car. Out of Sear Corner and down the straight. It's getting warm again now, so what will happen to that temperature gauge? A contrasting style of the wheel between Lanfranchi and John Clayland, who now has just thought about adjusting the mirror. Clayland's gear changes are gentler than those of Lanfranchi. But for all that, he's hard and fast on the car. And coming out of the S's here gets very crossed up indeed. That's what's known as sideways. Behind there an Astra, and the Nova moves in front of him, so he has to go around him. Three GM cars together as they come up towards Russell. The sun now low, troubling the drivers as far as vision's concerned. And now we see lights going on, first there on the Lancia of Ian Taylor, number 48. The Cowles Transport Mercedes going well is now at the second place. And both Rovers, too, are finding form. But with the pit stops and the problems taking their toll on the field, at seven hours, car number 30, Graham Scarborough, together with Ken Crofton and David Yates, lead the field. From number 43 Capri, Roy Eaton, David Oates and John Clark, and number 36, the Roger Bennington, Chris Blythe, George Cayley and Mike Andrew Capri. With number 24, Roger Williams, Mike Ridley, Dave Wallace and Mike Littlewood, making Capris in the first four places, ahead of the escort of Mike Smith. The Double Zero Escort RS1600 Turbo has proved to be an exceptionally quick car, auguring well on this their debut in motor racing. Number 50 Astra is going well behind the Mercedes, which has now dropped to sixth place as a result of the tyre problems, 
while number 55 Capri, the Marshall Khan Mark Peters car, is behind them. Night falls, a little months of racing in the dark in Great Britain, once a year at Snetterton. the 24 and the James K Nova has spun and rolled on the oil dropped by the Capri number 30 of Scarborough that was leading the race as darkness fell. The Astros are going well and for that matter a number of other cars have made their mark. The Monza is having to be driven on the temperature gauge as the head has definitely warped due to the overheating. 
Although he's climbing back up, it's not quick enough to figure in the results. The Ian Taylor Lancia has had its problems, but it's still in the race and going well, on its way now to a scheduled stop. Both the Mercedes are moving up steadily, and for that matter, so is Mike Smith with the RS1600 Turbo Escort. The Volvo is going well, though not figuring in the results. A far cry from the performance of the turbocharged Volvos in the European Touring Car Championship. As the Volvo leaves the pits, shortly to retire, the Fiat comes in for what is originally a scheduled stop, but mechanical problems intervene. After 10 hours racing, in the lead is Capri number 43. Superbly prepared and beautifully driven as well, but he's being run very closely by the Ford Escort RS1600 Turbo. Mike Smith doing quite a lot of the driving and proving that this could be a very competitive car indeed. But as 43, the Roy Eaton David Oates John Clark Capri prepares to leave the pits, they know that closing in on that leading group is the Mercedes 190. Car number 34, Martin Carroll, Mike Wilds and Mike Knight making a bid as in trouble here after that oil looping problem, the Scarborough Capri. in the morning and Roy Eaton, David Oates and John Clark lead the race. From Martin Carroll, Mike Knight, 
Gerard Sir and Mike Wilds in second place. While in third place, we get another Capri, and this time it's the Roger Bennington, Chris Blythe, George Kelly, and Mike Andrew car. Behind them, and going hard still, is the Escort RS1600i. Jimmy McCray, now at the wheel of the Opel Monza, still trying to make up time. Ford Capri, Mercedes, Ford Capri, RS1600. But the rally star at the wheel of the Monza is a joy to behold as he carves his way through the traffic in a car that still has to be nursed as the leader comes through once again, still with his lights on. The pure reliability of this car has been an amazing factor of this race. Added to that, none of the drivers are particularly experienced in circuit racing. But there's some tired faces in the pits. Asleep on your feet? Well, no, not quite. But there are various ways of going about it. The shadows begin to shorten, and Mike Smith's appetite for getting up early in the morning is setting him in good stead as he races now through the field. The BMW is still there, so is the Toyota, and the leading Capri is about to lap both of them. Number 50 Astra is racing with the other Toyota, the John Brindley car, for the lead in the class. They're on the same lap, and it's nose and tail. While Martin Cowell's Mercedes, with very little work done to it, is going magnificently in second place as Mike Smith comes in for a scheduled stop. Mike, we saw you last week celebrating 100 years at Silverstone yeah. Motor 100, and here you are at Snetterton. 24 hours endurance race. How's it been going for you? I've just celebrated 21 hours in my 100 years, yeah. It's going all right. I mean, it was, it was brilliant overnight. We uh, were second overall, which for a car which has never is uh, quite remarkable. And that we're still going at 21 hours is quite remarkable. We have a turbo problem, so we're down about 500 revs. We just go for a finish and try and hang on to what I think is a fairly secure fourth place at the moment, providing Lionel's can keep it going. You know, we're, we're doing three hour shifts, which is why I look as wrecked as I am. <laughs> Mike, is this your first uh, real thrash at endurance? No, this is, in fact, this is the fourth one of these that I've done. Uh, the fourth will hire. Uh, and the first one I retired from, I was partnered with uh, Jim Crawford and a Talbot. And then the second one was in a BMW and it came 10th. Third one was last year in a Capri 2.8 and finished fifth. And we were hoping that that progression would carry on and we'd win this year. But I think, I think winning is a bit out of the question at the moment. Russell, we're now some 20 hours into the race. Uh, a long night has gone through. How's your car been handling out there? Uh, very well. We had one very small problem when uh, a pipe to the oil pressure gauge broke. Otherwise, it's behaved very well, Touchwood. And particularly at night, we had a very, very good run. In fact, I think because of the cool air, our times were much quicker at night than in the daytime. This is the first year that this race has been run for production saloons. How have you found that this particular car has stood up to an endurance test of this type? So far, so good, said the man as he jumped off the top of the 15-storey block of flats. That's what he said when he went past the 10th floor window. <laughs> Are you superstitious, Russell? No, but the event's not over yet. I mean, there's another three hours of racing, and uh, that's very hard on a car. You know, the, they've had a lot of pounding, and well, we're keeping our fingers crossed, but we have to see what happens. Tony, it's been a long, long, hard race. 21 hours plus. I don't know, half the time we're in the pit. <laughs> it has been a long race for you, though, a hard one this year. Yeah, it's been a good, I mean, we were unfortunate, we got a, a hole through the radiator very early on and we lost so many laps, but other than that, the car's going beautifully and it's a pity, but there you are, it's lovely weather. It's a fast circuit, Snetterton, uh, how does the Opal handle out there? Oh, it's a, it, really, I, I mean, we thought we were going to win this race this year and I think we could have done, but uh, unfortunately we didn't. So where do you move on to next? What's next in the pipeline for you? I'm doing Le Moyne in a couple of weeks um, with a, I don't know what in, some economy run we're doing. Uh, I think this race here is the finest race in the world and I've done all the 20, I've done Daytona and Spa and Le Mans. This is great, it really is. There's no time to relax. There's a lovely atmosphere to it and everybody enjoys it. It's, it's great. So in spite of their problems with the car, 
As far as Tony Lanfranc is concerned, he's thoroughly enjoying the 24-hour race here at Snetterton. And what about Scotsman Jimmy McRae? Is he enjoying his race? Jimmy, the world of rally driving is one normally um, where we find you, but here at Snetterton, 24 hours, an endurance race for production saloon cars. You've had a few problems out there last night. Yes, uh, well, we've, I personally haven't had any problems. The two stints I've done, the cars run perfect. We've had no problems, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. But uh, the cars had uh, hold the holder radiator and had some that had gasket problems, and, you know, we've dropped about 100 laps, I think. How do you find the Opel as a car to drive? The car itself, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, a very nice road car and it's not one that you would expect to see flying around a circuit, but the car handled very well and uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. But the Mercedes challenge was not yet over. By 12 o'clock, this car had taken the lead briefly from the Capri. Mike Wiles, Martin Carroll, Gerard Sir and Mike Knight racing wheel to wheel with the Capri after 20 hours. And number 43 really hustling through the traffic now. They're back in front of the Mercedes, but only just. This is an immensely wearing battle. The Merc tucked in right behind there. No quarter asked, none given. And is David Oates tired after all this battling? Yeah, that's right. Well, in fact, um, tired. I mean, it's not a word for it, but we're always at the moment, and it's his car, he knows the car. What we're hoping to do is the pit stop, the major pit stop's been done, brakes are done, everything's done, tyres are done. All he's got to do is one more fuel. So it's down to uh, laps really against the Merc. Your Capri stood up very well in this endurance test so far. Hasn't, hasn't missed a beat at all. Um, we had a couple of little teasing problems. One was the studs on the uh, front hubs. Um, apart from that, just, you know, getting used to it. I mean, it's only a second year, so he's ever attempted anything like this, and I've never done it before. Can't be bad. Three cars unclassified by one o'clock, and only eight retirements from the race. The closing stages, and number 43 Capri would appear to be in charge. But if there's no battle for the lead, there's certainly a tremendous battle in the classes. For as the Capri reeled off the final laps, closing faster and faster on the Llewellyn Vauxhall, driven now by Andy Ackerley, was John Brindley with a Toyota. After 23 hours and 40 minutes racing, there was just four seconds between them and eventually the Toyota closed up on the tail of Ackerley. In spite of all the pit stops that were going out and Llewellyn's disconsolate face tells the story all by itself, Brindley's closure on the Vauxhall looked about to steal the class away. Bill Clayland confers as through comes Andy Ackerley once more. With three minutes to go, the Toyota takes the lead on the penultimate lap only to run out of petrol and see himself repassed by the Vauxhall. The flag comes out and the Vauxhall wins his class. But victory goes overall to Roy Eaton, David Oates, John Clark with the Capri 2.8i. 970 laps, 92.88 miles per hour. From the Martin Carroll, Mike Knight, Mike Wiles, Gerard Firm, Mercedes 190.16 on 968 laps. Roger Williams, Mike Ridley, Dave Wallace and Mike Littlewood third on 956 laps. The prize presentations and John Llewellyn, Russell Brooks and Andy Ackley win Class C. The Class A winners, of course, the row of the test of Bob Irving, Chris Mullard, Roy Dunnett and Paul Taft. But the overall winners of the Uniroyal Production Saloon Car Championship round, the Will Hire 24-hour race at Snetterton, were Roy Eaton, David Oates and John Clark with the Ford Capri 2.8i followed by the Mercedes. And as the winning drivers go out for their presentation, let us reflect on a tremendous victory for an inexperienced team in a very, very long and arduous event. Superb weather at Snedderton this year and the first time that it's been run purely for Group N saloon cars. They receive the magnificent Rose Bowl and the other trophies. A we talk with the winning drivers. Roy, an incredible race, a very surprising win. Um, everybody here surprised at the end, but you must be extremely pleased and the entire team. We are very. It, it's unbelievable how a car can run for that for that long and not give any trouble. It was. Uh, it's just nice to sit there and drive something like that. It's lovely. And the Capri's obviously proved itself as an endurance car. Yeah, they're just 100 percent. It's just. I bet it could still do another one again. It's. It's lovely. So, John, do you think you'll be uh, here next year? 
I reckon so, yeah. I've got the taste for this um, circuit racing, saloon circuit racing now, so uh, that's the next step, I think. Sell the old rallycross Porsche and uh, have a bash at this. <laughs> uh, Dave, finally, I spoke to you in the pits in the early hours of the morning. You were looking very tired. You're not looking quite as tired now. You're looking overwhelmed and extremely pleased. You must be pleased with the result. Yeah, really good, really pleased. Yep. So come back next year. Well, we look forward to seeing you all here next year and hopefully another win. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks Thanks a lot. Lot. Cheers. Cheers. And finally, a word with Roger Williams, Managing Director of Will Hire, and third overall in his own event. Roger, the culmination of an awful lot of work, I'm sure, but a magnificent success, a superb race as well. We enjoyed it very much. It's gone very well. The whole event has built up enormously over the years. It's now established as a classic in its own right, and so we shall carry on doing it as long as the public keep wanting to come and watch it. I'm well, sure we had this fantastic finish which I don't think, uh, if you'd written a book about the finish of the race, I don't think you could have got it that, that competitive right at the end with classes being fought on the last lap. And The concept of a, a race of this length for production saloon cars is, is pretty unique. It's unique certainly in this country. Uh, are you pleased with the result? The result of the, the race, yes, and I'm very, very, very pleased with the result of the uh, build-up of the event as an event. And as you know, no 24 hours race had ever been held in England before we started this one six years ago. And uh, it's really caught people's imagination and it gives them the opportunity to come out and spend the weekend in Sneston and uh, really enjoy their with our wonderful car look. <laughs> well, it has been a superb weekend, beautiful yeah. weather. I don't think we could have wished for anything That's better right. than this and superb crowds as well. So That's right. another race next year? Certainly, yes. Absolutely, we'll, we'll be, be here next year and I expect they will be too. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing you again. Bye, thank you very much.